Kei te tuake a hau ki te mihi, ki te mana whenua, ko te ati awa, ki tēnei whare, whare mahana, um, te, te whare taonga poka poka o Newtown. Um, you did a wonderful thing. You actually allowed me the opportunity to continue to pay a tribute to what happened here two weeks ago in Newtown. And in particular, I'm really sorry, I've, I've flown in from Auckland, I see my cousins over there, and I see Marilyn over here, and I see many of, um, of our colleagues, and I wish I had been here earlier to the funeral of Mike the Juggler. My grandson loved Mike the Juggler. When I first introduced him to Mike the Juggler, I mean, I don't know Mike the Juggler, but when we used to go down Lambton Quay and we would see him and then he would say, Papa, 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 there's that juggler, you know. And so, so there would be Mike going up and down with the balls. And what was fascinating for, um, for uh, Ben was that he kept on saying, is he going to drop any? And so we <laughs> had to stay there for around about 10 minutes, you know, and then he'd say, no, he's not going to drop any, Papa. And in many ways, that's a metaphor for what we're doing in a kind of shelter, or the, um, the people who are in the book. We're trying to keep all of these balls up so that they don't fall, because it's kind of like chicken licking. You know, if the balls fall, then the world is in a terrible state of disaster. So for Ben, this was the most magnificent thing, to see this man smiling away and juggling and juggling and juggling, and as I say, tonight, I've come here tonight and thought, this is what the book is all about. It's about trying to save the world by keeping all of those balls up in the air. <laughs> so, um, kia koe, uh, Mike, awe te aroha, awe te mamai, awe te tangi, mō tō tātou, hoa. Haere, haere, haere atura, haere, ki te wā kainga tūturu o te tātou, ngā tuanui i te rangi. And now I'll turn to what I should be saying. Whakarongo ake au ki te tangi atu manu nei atu mā tui 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 a. Tui a runga, tui a raro, tui a roto, tui a waho. Tui te here tangata ka rongo te ao ka rongo te pō. Tonight, we are in Newtown Public Library. And it's a very beautiful whare. We can see all of these fantastic decorative motifs. Māori Pacifica above us for this very special hui to celebrate Whakaruru Taha, a kind of shelter. And the library is really beautiful with books inside and the children's playground outside that me and Jane used to bring the kids and then the grandkids to play. And then I've just been out to the toilets and I think they're absolutely impeccable. <laughs> <laughs> well, Newtown is my hood. It's my grandchildren's hood. It's obviously your hood as well. And all our children who go and play out there and then come in here are our future. And there were always birds in the trees. And there are birds in the book. And they are birds of prophecy, of coruscating beauty, calling us all to unite, to reconnect the umbilical of earth to sky, to twine our humanitarian aspirations with humanitarian actions to become kaitiaki. Well, here we are inside this whare taonga poka poka, and Nicola, Michelle, and I have an easy job of imagining it for you with just a few added embellishments as a millennial marae, or cave-like dwelling, Plato's cave, perhaps set within the sheltering curve of Papatuanuku, as of old, when she sheltered her sons during that cataclysmic time when Tane separated earth from sky, Papatuanuku shelters us again in the early second decade of this millennium. For are the times of that separation any different to the tumultuous and various challenges we face today? as Nicola has implied. Well, above us in the book, in the whare tipuna of the book, is the tahuhu, the backbone. And the backbone is created out of all of the artists who are in the book. 
In the front are the barge boards, the mahi, and along the length of the space is a tepu korero, a table at which many conversations have already taken place, but none more urgent than now for us living in 2023. Here, the onamata, the past, is in korero with the inamata, the present, to offer us a glimpse of the unknown anamata, the world waiting for us all on the horizon, including for that little boy or girl back there who's, 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 who's laughing and chuckling away there because they are the future, and that's why we wrote this book, to make sure that that laughter would continue in a time of some despair. A kind of shelter is the book as a hui, a book that talks our story as we look at that future hanging there. And tonight, as Nicola has said, is the third of the book, Kui Taumata. It's summits. Yeah, that's what it is. It's the summit. And we have asked all of these people, not only the people here, but people from overseas, to come and talk about those things that interest them about that world um, in the future. Well, 68 writers and eight artists offered by way of poem, short fiction, creative nonfiction, painting and photography, caught it all concerning decolonization, indigeneity, family, climate change, equity, you and me. And their work, like Pip's work for instance, is, a, is pure unadulterated joy, like your work, Fiti, is just pure unadulterated joy. And all of you have made a whakaruru taha, what I like to call a big haka boogie of a book. <laughs> it's a book that rocks. Now, sometimes the corridor is explicitly about the, pr about the subject. At other times, it is contained more implicitly by very artistic people who think implicitly, not like me, I'm a, such an explicit person when I write. So it is contained, for instance, implicitly in a walk with a beloved child or in a memory of eating food in a Chinese market. And you yourself must find the understanding in all of the layers of meaning being offered to you, to us. Tuia e te kawai tangata, ka heke mai ki Hawaii ki nui, Hawaii ki roa, Hawaii ki pāma māu ki te hono i wairua ki te pae ao ki te ao mārama. I see that we are here. They, some of the contributors, are here. You, the audience, are here. Now, this summit in Utah can begin. Please welcome my good friend and co-editor, Michelle Elby. Kia ora. Thank you, Witty. Wonderful to have you introduce the book and to have Nicola here. Um, it's really nice to meet you so many times recently uh, in our various launches and talks. Uh, as Nicola suggested, every time that we've presented this book, it's been a little bit different. We've had a different set of readers, a different set of artists talking about the book, and here in Wellington, it's really special. Um, I think this might be the first reading where we have a really wide sampling from the book, which includes the different kinds of contents. So, for example, we have poetry in the book, uh, there are essays, uh, creative nonfiction reflections, fiction, storytelling, and also this korero, which uh, which he hinted at, and it's this idea that we wanted someone in New Zealand to be talking with someone else from overseas, and we basically gave people very broad topics, everyone in the room here, um, and said, see what you come up with, and everyone came up with really remarkable contents, which you're going to hear a lot of tonight. We're gonna move through this material pretty quickly, uh, but we're also gonna keep it pretty casual because this is our chance to correro with each other. Really, for the first time, it's really nice to be here with everyone, so thanks for that. Um, I thought that we would start with talking a little bit about the artwork because the other really special thing about tonight's reading is that we have Noah Noah with us, and uh, she is this remarkable printmaker who uh, we decided to include some of her work in the book, 
And then after we looked at all the artworks that were going to be included, uh, this piece really stood out. And one of the things I really love about this cover, and all of you who have the book, you will see it, it sort of wraps around from front to the back, and that's the piece. Uh, she's also brought one of the prints uh, that we have up here, and you're welcome to come and look at it up close. It's really a beautiful piece of work. One of the things I really love about this artwork is that there's a kind of fluidity to it. I feel like in Noah Noah's work, there's all this movement. There's always suggestion of something that you're contemplating, and then you walk away, and you come back, and you see something else. And I think that's what an anthology can often do. You dip in, you read something, and then you come back to it again, and maybe you hear a different voice, or you examine another piece of writing with a different view because you've just read something else. So there's a lot of really interesting layering happening in the pages, and I think that Noah Noah's work really sets that um, stage for us as the opening uh, to look at and to hold in your hands. And um, I wanted to start by asking Noah Noah to talk a little bit about her artwork. The other thing that's really wonderful, and then I'm gonna pass the mic over, we're just gonna hand the mic around, uh, is that this piece, we didn't know it when we chose it, but this piece is called Embrace. And I think that's such a beautiful title for this piece of work and maybe gives us a really nice starting point for talking with all of you. So thank you for coming and I'm gonna hand you the mic. Thank you, Michelle. Um, kia ora koutou and what a beautiful, um, Introduction and welcome. Um, I um, have prepared a couple of, of pieces to read here just in, because I thought I might get a bit nervous um, in front of an audience. So um, in terms of talking to this piece, I wanted to firstly say um, that it is a real honour and pleasure to be here tonight to be launching a kind of shelter um, on its journey to its audience, so to be part of that is extremely special. Um, so I live here in Wellington, in Whanganui Atara, and I am a visual artist working primarily in the medium of print. Um, and this particular cover piece, as um, Michelle mentioned, is called um, Embrace. So I'm very humbled that it is what wraps around this anthology. Um, literally, <laughs> um, and, all of the and all of the stories and poems that are within its covers. Um, so very briefly, in terms of my process, um, my art-making process is the way in which I make sense of the world and my place within it. Um, it allows my subconscious to come to the fore through symbolism and characters which enact my lived experience. As such, I think this art and the images within it, um, hang on. As such, I think this art in particular uh, reflects the poems and stories as, uh, what have I written here? Let me just start again, because please excuse me. As such, art reflects in images what poems and stories do in words. They can tell you of the world as lived and seen and felt. As part of this work, um, or when I do work with printmaking, I take a moment to be the viewer of what I've created when I'm finished. And <clears throat> as part of this, I write what I see and feel. I'm not entirely sure what to call that part. I'm not sure whether it's a poem or a story or just the name of the work. Um, but I like to think of it as a hand to hold for the viewer, a place to start their own relationship with the work, a place to swing from to their own interpretation. And in that way, words on the page, just like the cuts in wood which make my art, can be seen as many different things to different eyes. But in the sharing of that, of, that, of what is uh, what has lived, I'm hopeful that we can all feel more connected. I thought, very briefly, if I may, there's a very small piece that uh, is what goes with this particular piece, which I'm not sure if you were aware of before it was selected, but a very small, um, so the writing that came for this was, 
just it's like a little synopsis of what I've seen in it, which might help you in the same way as us talking about our work might um, help people into the understanding of um, each contributor's piece. So, embrace. There are two beings, one light, the other dark, and they are interlocked in an embrace. One has wings, the other a long, thin nose. Both are like clouds passing one another. There are mermaids and birds and Celtic dragons floating upside down in the sky. Do a handstand and you might see them. The sea is made of scales, links of water connected in movement. This image is a dream of water and clouds intermingling, like on a misty day. So feel free to do handstands afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That's really interesting to hear you talk about it. And I'm so glad that you were able to read that piece that goes with it. Um, it really provides a wonderful, you didn't even know this, but a wonderful jumping off point. I was sitting here thinking, oh, who's going to read first? This is so exciting. Um, but I thought I might turn to Pip next, because Pip Adam is here with us. And yep, there you go. You're on the spot. Uh, Pip had this extraordinary, well, we think it was extraordinary. We think what they did was extraordinary, so we'll, we'll hear in your own words. Uh, Pip spoke with, oh, we asked for a correro, this conversation, and when we put two people together, again, it was someone from New Zealand and someone from overseas, and there was a wide variety. They did not know each other. They came from completely different disciplines and backgrounds, and uh, I don't know, maybe that was a wicked trick that Witty and I played, but we thought it would be really fun to see. And as it turns out, they came up with really unusual and wonderful responses. And this idea of seeing things differently, how in your artwork, if you're in relationship with it, we're in relationship with it, and there's always different things to look at and examine. I think that's a really interesting question now to bring to Pip, because the, the title of uh, Pip Adam and Ashley Johnson's piece is Looking for Boas in the mangroves. And it's this wonderful conversation between nonfiction and fiction, between these two different voices. And uh, I would just love to hear what kinds of things you and Ashley felt like you were looking for, and what did you find? Um, thank you so much, and thanks everybody. I really appreciate it. It's lovely to be at the library um, after dark. It's very exciting. Um, yeah, so, um, I am always at my happiest when I'm working with other people in this way, um, and I just really like it, just that idea of shelter. I just find there's nowhere to hide in a collaboration. Um, I, I get to abandon or surrender all control, which I really, really love. And I think it's really hard to talk about the um, um, sort of physical manifestations of what we were looking for. But I do feel like um, there was this kind of energetic relationship, if you know what I mean. Like when I was walking around, I um, Ashley is in Canada, and um, we were meeting in summer and winter. And I know that climate change has made things pretty average around the world. But he was walking in like very hard frost and snow, and there was he was actually snowed in for part of it. And when I would walk around, I would almost feel like this magnetic pull of him in the north and me in the south. And every it's, it's really hard to describe because it felt like a full body experience. And um, when I looked at Ashley's art, um, I sort of felt it in my body rather than in my mind. And I think that when we talked, um, it was very much like that. Sometimes we would just sit on Zoom quietly <laughs> and not say anything. <laughs> and yeah, that wonderful day and night thing where I would wake up to emails from him and it was almost like they'd been dreamed, if you know what I mean. And like, yeah, it was, it was really a magnificent experience. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I think um, this weird thing where neither one of us had control so there was space for something different to be in control. But yeah, it was, I'm very incredibly grateful to both of you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. 
That's actually really neat to hear you talk about um, that sense of control and also that thing you said about the mind and body. And I think that happens for everybody who's in some kind of creative endeavor that you, you actually have to give up control and you have to have uh, some way of operating in that space, I think, that's between mind and body and spirit and whatever else is in going into your work. Um, and that brings to mind, I'm, I'm thinking of all the people we have who are going to read today. Um, I think that there is that sense that there is this mind and body relationship that happens when we're writing that's not always in our control, but then you sort of, it's always a path of discovery. And I'm reminded of a conversation we were having with Sudha about uh, the poem that she includes and how it sort of expanded outward. I don't even know how much control you had over that, but I'd love to hear you talk about it and maybe read a small excerpt. Would you like to do that? Yeah, come on up. Sudha Rao. Turn this around because I feel bad showing my back to you guys. Um, um, turn around. Tena koto katoa, ko sudhara toko ingawa. I was I like you, Pep, extremely grateful to have been invited to to, to contribute to this this piece of work, and. Um, the time of COVID was actually a time of, of limitations and shutting down. But for me, working on um, this piece, well, it didn't begin, well, this piece began as it uh, was happening anyway, uh, was an amazing connection with my mother. My mother is 93 years old this year. But when I wrote this, she was 90. And she'd been a widow for about 13 years. And like you, Pip, we did a Zoom conversation because I couldn't see her, be with her. And what began as mundane conversations about the weather and what walks we'd taken and what food we'd eaten or not, as the case maybe you know, in her case. Um, I, said to her, I said to her one day, Mom, I said, why, you know, I'd like to know what you were like as a little girl. What did you do as a little girl? And that was kind of the start of uh, the most wonderful conversation I've ever had. Um, and so very lucky to have had the opportunity to, to um, had have had that kind of insight into, into, into not just her life, but also our pitra, our tupuna, our ancestors, because she brought down, she told me stories about herself, my grandmothers, my great-grandmothers, my great-grandfathers, my grandfathers, my uncles, my aunties, her uncles and her aunties. And when you are a migrant person like I am, it's not often you get a chance to actually have those conversations. And more importantly for me, becoming a New Zealander was just all the time being affirmed, affirmation that who you are, um, who made you, who gave you the breath of life is, is such a common and important thing. And through my mother, she longs to go back home. And I think we can all understand what that means and feels like. So this poem is actually dedicated to her because through that COVID time, um, she actually sheltered me. She gave me the sense of belonging, sense of acceptance, and also more, more, more importantly, I removed the anxiety that was slowly building up or about all the things, Nicola, that you were talking about. So I'm just gonna read a little bit. Um, my, it's a long poem and um, I'll just read the prologue and get you guys to finish the story. It's the start of the story. Coracle at a Confluence. Prologue. The first time I saw a coracle was the last time, was the last sight of my father sliding off a riverbank in a small, elegant box. Shouldered by his son's calm and focused, grave faces, the boatman pushed off a riverbank, glistening and below the coracle. Water, a swirling green silk sari, unfolded a climbing ancient certain sun over grass, losing dew by sun rising. The monsoon had gone, leaving a wake of flora like a ritual path 
slow and deliberate, for my father turned ash. My father's journey was his last with family on a coraco to join his parents at the Holy Reverse Conference. The photograph showed a simple box paddled down a silent river, leaving my mother behind, but not captured by the shot. There are no pictures of my mother on the day my father journeyed, leaving her banked alone, edged by the fright of it all. 13 years ago, she was at a conference standing on her soil, harnessing timidity to rise from his ash newborn. Kia ora. Thank you, Sudha. Thanks very much. Um, it brings to mind the things we've already talked about. It really makes those connections for me, and I hope for everyone here, about the way most of the people who are in this book had this way of connecting with other people as they were. It's what their writing seems to reveal, whether it's through a conversation like Pip had, a conversation with your mother, um, or the way you're in dialogue with the material itself. And so uh, I want to ask just the people sitting up here. We have Greg and Yawen and Tina. And um, I thought it might be really interesting to ask you, as you were writing, uh, you know, we have poetry, we have fiction, uh, we have, I would call it creative nonfiction, is Yawen's contribution. And uh, you're all in dialogue, I think, with either family, generational dialogue. Uh, Greg has this expansive conversation with the world. Uh, so I'm really curious about that sense of how you feel like you're in dialogue when you're writing, and specifically how that works in the context of this book. Michelle, that's kind of interesting. You say, I'm in dialogue with the world. That makes me sound like a megalomaniac <laughs> or, or something like that. But it's completely true, though. I mean, but I, but I guess that's what poets do in a way. And um, yeah, I suppose I'm aiming broadly. And I suppose in the, in the last decade of my life, I've had quite a lot to do with um, various environmental initiatives. And so I guess, in a way, that sort of gets you, in a way, trying to find yourself as a writer entering the field, I guess, beyond humanities kind of um, usual patch. You know, um, I was very involved in the Kermadec Art Initiative um, to do with trying to form a sanctuary of the, in the marine waters around the Kermadec Islands north of New Zealand, um, which is still very much in play and might come to fruition this year, I reckon, but we'll see how it's going. Um, but at the core of that kind of environmental thing is the idea of sanctuary, which is very much shelter. I mean, sh sanctuary, you know, for, for nature is, I guess, the non-human version of shelter. It's a place where nature recovers, is revivified. And um, yes, I mean, for me, the excitement with this project was actually the word shelter to start with, because, I mean, yes, we have, you know, the, shelter, the homeless shelter, you know, the, um, the kind of shelters that human beings need, but also... Um, it's what all of nature needs. We need places to replenish. Um, um, often nature needs to recover from us, so it's, it needs shelters to get over humanity. Um, and that's a kind of another kind of dialogue, I guess, the dialogue between humanity and nature, and one where I think we want to, um, I don't know, I suppose as a writer, I sort of want to go in there and um, not so much talk sense, I think just somehow evoke some kind of sense of being in the world and being one with it, at the same time being different from it too. Um. <laughs> oh, great, great. Um, <laughs> uh, how do I begin talking about this? Um, I confess that I was quite anxious when I first pitched my piece to Michelle because the tone of it felt so dark. I wasn't sure it was appropriate. And um, thank you for talking about sanctuary and shelter because this is this piece is me coming to terms with what do you do when your home isn't safe? Um, what, where do the young children go for shelter when home isn't safe for them? And this is a kind of reckoning between myself and my father who is a really problematic person for me. And I'm so grateful for having the safe container to do so especially because I feel like with migrant families, this is a very hard thing to talk about. And it's an intergenerational dialogue. Um, everything I say in the piece is true. When my father passed, um, I declined to speak at his funeral. 
And that was about a decade ago. And this is me finding my voice to kind of talk to my father. This is what I would have said to him. Um, and yeah, I was like, during the lockdown period, I held, I worried about so many families for whom the young children had no safe space to go. Yeah. Oh, yes, I can read the opening. <laughs> this is the lightest part. It's in six parts. Um, Chanten, verb, to inherit, to pass on a legacy. I think about how to talk about Papa in my mother tongue. I watch the sunset bruise. If only the winds could sweep away hurts like clouds. I speak the two characters, Tuan and Tun, like a spell. Each character is a locus of meaning, the nuclei of a word cloud formed of bonded pairs of characters. I learned about molecular bonds from my father, ionic, covalent, metallic. I wonder how he might have described our bond. In Mandarin, intergenerational bonds comprise of two verbs, tuan, to transmit, and tun, to bear. Blood tastes metallic. Sometimes we are handed heavy shit. Sometimes we refuse the torch for personal reasons. Yeah, um, kia ora. Um, thank you for that. That was so beautiful. Um, and interestingly, um, I have a similar maybe situation in that I actually wasn't thinking about shelter when I think I might have got a slightly different prompt. So, <laughs> I was but I ended up writing about shelter, which is really interesting. Um, and um, from a similar place, what happened is um, I went to a hui. Uh, um, about going home to one of my marae, which happens every year. And um, so the, the story that I wrote was the story that I just had at that moment um, for this. And um, it, it, was, it felt like the only s story I could write right then. So I kind of made up the characters, but the, the ev events of it are pretty much true, which was that I went to this hui. We, we had a cutting a workshop and um, one of the aunties said like you know it's the scariest thing in the world if you've ever tried to cut a <laughs> just the scariest one of the aunties said you can't be wrong when you're home she literally and I was just like that simple simple phrase I think I just was so much permission to just fail miserably <laughs> because there's you know there is no failure when you're home um and I think and it took me 47 years to get there which is really interesting so coming from a, a place that's similar where that the nuclear family or the family of origin isn't a home and then you know spending a lot of time trying to go back to homes and it, it took decades to get to that moment of feeling okay and so that's kind of what the story ended up being. Um, yeah, so very grateful to be in the collection too. Do you want to tell us about the title of your piece? Atia. Um, well, because, well, yeah. So when you karanga, you karanga across the marae atia, so which can mean space, but it can also be a place of battle, a place of conflict. Um, and so the other part of that story is also the conflicts of being um, in community in the city and then going home and going, oh, it, it's okay, you're, you're home now, yeah. Mm. So that the Atia is a positive and negative space, I guess. There's a lot going on in that space, uh, yeah. Mm. Oh, that's actually really wonderful to hear you talk about that. Thank you. And uh, one of the things I wanted to say here is that a lot of the pieces in the book seem to talk across that space to each other without us really knowing it. You know, when Witty and I, you, you put the call out there and you get the material in, and it's a lot of uh, 
possibly unwieldy material. And then you look at it and you think, how does this fit together? How does it work? And so a lot of our job as the editors is to consider the sequence of things, consider how they work together. And um, only just now, sitting here and hearing what you're saying, Tina, quite spontaneously, it takes me actually to Janice's piece. And I don't think I even want to give any introduction. I would just love for you to come up and you can talk about it or share it, because I think there's something really special about the space and the individual and community in there. Oh, kia ora. Um, uh, kia ora tato, uh, called Janice Frigard toko ingoa. Um, so I might just go ahead and read it. Um, it's called You'll Never See Unless You Look. It's a, a bit of a, a meditation on, I guess, accessing the subconscious through dreams. Your head sinks into the pillow. You pass through the tunnel where sometimes, briefly, voices speak words that don't quite make sense, where there are shapes and patterns you only ever see in this state. Then you're through to the other world, the sleep world. It's different here. Life happens in fragments. Time means nothing. A friend can become a cat and then your cousin. You see someone you know, but they are wearing a stranger's face. Electrical appliances will not work. The dead were never dead. Try to wake up inside this world. This way you can influence events. Flying is a good option for you. It may take a few tries. To start with, you might be hovering just above the ground, worrying about crashing down. Don't, don't think about that. Concentrate on levitating above rooftops and trees. Get as high as you can, because the view from here will be better. See, drink it in. Now you are a karea rea, or a spaceship. The city with all its city concerns is far below. If you're not flying and find yourself in a large house and you are very afraid of what is in the basement, Go on down there, descend those cold concrete stairs. The house is you. Open the basement door and say hello to yourself. Thank you, Janice. I think these things flow really beautifully together and I love being able to hear them one after another, which brings me to Emma, because I think in this book, there are all these conversations, the big world, which Greg talks about, uh, the idea of tomorrow. Um, actually, uh, what Tina mentioned, it's worth saying that also as editors of an anthology, we, you, know, you, you come to it with these big ideas, and Nicola and Witty and I had many ideas about how it would all take shape. And uh, for a long time, one of the main themes was the idea of looking at tomorrow. But that's a pretty big topic. But we actually did put it out there. We said, tell us about tomorrow. And uh, we ended up with some really wonderful material from that as well. Um, but one of the things that we have in the book that you see often is this conversation. Again, I, I keep coming back to this idea of dialogue that's between the I and the community, the individual and the group, or the I and the you, which we hear a lot of. And um, I think that opens up some kind of a space in a new way for us as readers and um, for the writer, I assume, uh, who's bringing the material to us. So Emma, I would love to hear you read that and I'm sure everyone else would as well. Kia ora koutou. Um, he tau iwi pakia au, uh, he tangata tariti au, uh, no aitirangi, no kotirangi, hoki o kutipuna. Um, e mihi ana Kina tohu o nihi o poniki e noho nei au um, no reira tina koutou, tina koutou, tina tātou katoa. Hi everyone, I'm Emma. Um, yeah, thank you Michelle for that lovely introduction. I guess as a writer I am totally obsessed with the I and the you. It's something that I just can't stop. Um, for me I think that's about um, community and connection being really hard. I have PTSD and it just makes humans so fraught but also... I'm so obsessed with them. I love them. They're so great. Um, so I won't explain much more about my piece except that it's called One Meter. 
Each human is one metre apart, in an arrangement we were not used to before this perfect vision. Each piece of you is received as something not unlike a gift. I've heard voices talking out in the hallway and understood nothing, and then I've stood across from you, only able to lip-read my way through to you. It is a gentle dimming of possibility, like lights through a long distance journey at night. It is as I thought all along. We are both threats and promises. Do you know that both can be contained and restrained by the right words, by the right spelling, and both are visible even at night? You say that you say that you say, a cough hidden in a throat clearing. It's good, a good game to be small and to hide. An even better game is to be large and free. The best game is to see the same question in the faces of others. What are you? Never answering, I just continue. I am the breeze, I've been the light, the trees and the night. I am just cells, layered up like lacquer, like resin, like subcutaneous fat. You don't need to know what I am. You don't need to see anything other than what you're already looking at. You don't know what you're looking at. I am what you're looking at. Thank you, Emma. Really wonderful to hear you read that. Um, it's really interesting for me, I'm sure it's the same for Witty as well, that you know we've read all of these pieces so many times by now, but when you hear them live with the live reading, they really take on a whole new shape and a feel, and I hope that's the experience for the audience as well. Uh, you really gain a sense of the voice of the writer, the voice of the person, and uh, the sense of the space and the purpose of the artwork, for example, on the page. Um, I thought I would ask a question of the two fiction writers in the room. Well, the ones who have, well, actually three. We have fiction, which is Pip, has already talked about the dialogue with Ashley Johnson. We have uh, Fitty and Tina. And, you know, by now everyone has a sense that we had these big topics that we were going to contemplate with this book. Um, and I think maybe one of the hardest challenges is asking someone to write a story, a fiction, a piece of fiction, which is its own contained view of the world, its own small universe, but that somehow reaches beyond its own borders to these bigger topics. And I would love to hear uh, the fiction writers talk a little bit about that because you know, it's, it's, we have that in contrast to talking to our mothers, talking to our fathers, talking to um, the idea of shelter and the world and safe spaces. These are all concepts that we certainly, everybody relates to. But when you're asked to write a piece of fiction about that, it's qu quite a big beast, isn't it? So I'm really curious to hear how you took that on. And Fiti, would you like to come up and say a few words and maybe share a bit of your piece? Thank you. Tēnā koutou. Ko Fiti Hiriaka ahau. What was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> How did I go about fiction. writing this fiction piece? Um, maybe I took the prompt of uh, conversation and dialogue too literally. Um, my piece is written as a dialogue between two voices. So, yeah, maybe it was a bit too much. These, these two voices are debating... Um, where to go to watch the rising of Matariki, but also a little bit of philosophy in there, and they're talking about um, film and Plato's cave that we talked about earlier. So I think I'll just jump in and, and read a bit. Atamari. I mean, is it? Still poor Marie from where I'm looking at, ne? Ata or poor, there's not a lot of Maria with you around. Oh, should I go back to bed then, eh? Come on, you grump, let's get going. I just don't see why we as a culture schedule everything to happen at the break of bloody dawn. <laughs> it's magic, though, when te poor gives way to light. Aye, but around 10.30 in the morning can be just as magical. Where's the car? Thought we'd walk. Good place, don't be far away. 
feels like an eternity. Well, we don't have an eternity. Kia tere. Why are you so chipper? Do you think I'm chipper? Well, awake. I kind of like this time of day. I only like, th like this time when you think of it as the end of a night, not the beginning of a day. It's just so still and quiet. That's because everyone is still bloody asleep. And they're missing this. What are they missing? Because I'm missing my bed. All of this. The sky will never look like this again. Everything is moving, constantly moving. Tomorrow it won't be exactly the same. And neither will be. Kia ora. Should I, um, yeah, so, yeah, I was mad because you gave me a thousand words. <laughs> and I was like, how am I going to write it? Because I'm not a short writer. So my preferred word length is about four to six thousand words. But Witsy and Michelle gave me a thousand. And I was like, how am I going to do that? So, yeah, it's hard. Yeah. It's really hard to um, create a fictional world in very few words. Um, so I thought the only thing I could do was write a scene and keep it very much within a very succinct um, time span, which is how I ended up with this. Should I read? Yeah, I'll read um, the beginning of the scene. It's called Artia. The first thing Auntie Ivy asks them, the first thing Auntie I Ivy asks them to do is sit in a circle and talk about their previous experiences. Layla is the first to volunteer. I've done it once. There was no one else and Papa Ronnie asked me to and helped me with the kupu. I can't remember what happened. None of it. She grins, shakes her head, clearly horrified. The other woman mirror her, wide-eyed. After a long pause, Amorani speaks. I started to last year. At the WA, it's something they teach us, but I feel too young to do it at home and away from home. I'm not sure Rangatahi should do it yet. Into the next pause, Lisa eventually says something, her voice shaky, uncertain. It comes up for me through my work more than any other situation, but I never know what's right. She thinks then of the colleague at her office in Wellington the loudness of that other voice, the quietness of her own. I'm the right age. I can feel the need that I'll be called on soon, but the ma is so deep. I don't think I'll have a strong enough voice. That's it with our generation, eh? It takes so much to get through that ma. We're in between our nannies and these confident young ones, the last generation to be raised without kōhanga or kūra. Her cousin is right, although Lisa wouldn't have had access to Kuda even if it had existed when she was a kid. She feels the barrier almost as if it is physical. I just want to feel some ease around it. Her words are urgent now. The karanga, the, the reo, all of it. I just want to feel like I'm okay where I am. The aunties look on, impassive, nodding. Then they start coaching but there are no instructions, no pointers, no methods. They tell, this, they tell stories, their own first times. Without exception, they were put on the spot, told when to do it and given a gentle shove. They'd been watching, sometimes for years. That was all the training they got. Lisa understands then. There can be no easing into something like this, but also they've all been where she is these queer who carry the whole habu in their calls back and forth across the marae atia, apprehensive, full of trepidation, daunted at the incredible responsibility. What if they make a mistake? What will befall the people if they screw up? Auntie Ivy is the last to speak. Remember, you're at home. You can't be wrong when you're home. 
Hörde. That was beautiful. Thank you, Tina. Uh, yeah, Pip, do you want to talk a little bit about, in your case, it was very unusual because you ended up writing fiction in response to nonfiction, which means you had to create, uh, break down all kinds of boundaries. I'm really curious about that. Yeah, um, I think um, I don't see a great delineation between fiction and nonfiction. Um, one of the writers that I look up to more than anyone else, Geordie Rosenberg, um, once said to me that um, a fiction can have an argument, like just like an essay can, but sometimes fiction is not as concerned with the the rightness or wrongness of that argument, if you know what I mean. Like it's not concerned with, um, you know, like f fighting you for that argument. And I, I think that that is really true. And I also like, yeah, I also think you know, I think as far as fiction and non-fiction goes, it's all kind of a contract between writer and reader. And I think that um, what I loved about working with Ashley with this is that that contract is a little fuzzier. Like, I still I still think it's a consensual relationship, but it's just, you know, it's a little bit fuzzier, and I really like that. And I was just thinking, um, I'm going to get all of this information wrong, so it's like fake news, but I was just thinking about the beautiful piece that won the Portraiture Award yesterday um, and was a uh, representation of a person but not in any realist, what we would consider in the Western world kind of realist way. And I think that that's, yeah, I, I guess everything I'm saying is just word soup, sorry, but I, I just think that um, sometimes an argument can be in mood like, you know, just like the beautiful pieces we've heard tonight, sometimes um, this exploration is in a brain kind of sustained argument and sometimes it's in a way that makes us forget our bodies or makes us feel a certain way. And I think that is as robust an argument or a robuster um, claim or a robust protest as, you know, like an academically thought out piece of work. Thank you. I, I love that. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, I think that's something that anthologies do really well. I mean, I'm a big fan of anthologies, obviously, uh, because they really do break down that boundary. A lot of times, for all of us who are writers in the room, you know, you're so often asked, is it fiction? Is it nonfiction? Is it poetry? Is it prose? And uh, often you don't really want to answer that question. You want it to be what it is, and readers can interpret as they want. Um, all of this brings me, I, I really want to squeeze in a question here for Witty at the end as well, because uh, Witty and I both have pieces in the, in the anthology as well. Uh, based on personal experiences, I think that they both uh, take on a kind of creative approach to telling nonfiction stories. Um, and I think what we hear in a lot of the pieces we heard, uh, the fiction pieces too, there's, a, there's kind of a, a sense of humor sometimes. And that's something we haven't touched on yet. But sometimes humor is really important in that way that we interact with each other and the way we carry these really heavy burdens that we're all carrying together. Um, Witty's conversation, he's involved in uh, one of our longest Correro, in part because it included three people. It was Witty speaking with Anne Salmon and Aparachida Vilaca, who is an anthropologist from Brazil. And everyone will know who Anne Salmon is. And uh, their conversation, wow, it just meandered all over the place to amazing topics, and they all relate together. Um, and one of the things I really loved in hearing the pieces that we've heard is how each one really captures the voice of the individual, this really personal feeling that I have tonight. And what I liked about these Correro that we have in the book is that they're deeply personal while also being about these broader themes that are universal. And I really wanted to ask you, Witty, how, uh, how did that feel for you? How do you go about with attacking these, these big, big topics with these two incredibly powerful women also uh, and bringing uh, sometimes levity, sometimes humor, sometimes almost like a childlike awe to it while also exploring these convergences and differences between cultures and histories and all of that. Uh, it's a pretty amazing, that Correro. So for those of you who haven't yet read the book, you have that in store as a real treat. 
Well, kia ora, Michelle. Um, the thing about all of the conversations that we had was that um, as editors, you and I, we were able to, to look at this work. And for instance, your work, Tina, begins the book, or very, very soon begins the book, and it's about a karanga. So in the sense of what our theme is, this is a karanga that we all have to learn to, to do, whether or not we are frightened about doing it or what, to the world. If we want to see some change in the world, then there has to be a karanga across the Aotea space. And so that really, really hit home to me, and that's why that piece of yours is, is, is at the very, very beginning there, because um, what if we fail to make the right karanga to the world? What then happens to the world? And then when Janice was talking about, I am the one that you are hearing, what she is referring to is not the she-she person or the he-he person or the they person, but an inclusive, no, when you look at us, you are looking at a collective of all of these various people, he, she, they, and so the person that you're looking at must be an inclusive person if we are to collectively um, go through the world. And then when you were talking, um, Fiti, um, the dialogue takes place at dawn. So as editors, we were thinking, so this is, could be the dawn of a new time. Yes, hopefully. And so this is the, this is the dialogue that is taking place between um, a male and, and a female. And so what they're doing is conversing on, well, what is the world going to be the next day? So all of these were, as I mentioned earlier, you have to work as the audience. And I, we, in, we hope, Nicola and Michelle, and I hope that you will enjoy working at all of these various subtexts, especially yours, Pip. There's so much subtext in this book, so much subtext, so much context, so much intertext, so much of what one might call the psychic text that we all need to understand if we are going to be creating this new world. So when I sat down with this conversation with Anne and with um, Aparachida from Brazil, and Aparachida was talking about um, a situation in Brazil where the, uh, the local uh, people have a different world view uh, to Māori, a totally different world view about what death is and about what life is. And it's, it's not a view that we know here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So it was important for us to have in the book a perspective that is so totally different from ours. And also a, a point of view that takes us back to what New Zealand might have been a hundred years ago. Because Aparachida is talking about a, a time um, in um, Brazil where the local uh, people of the Brazilian forest are facing extinction. And so we could relate that to the time in New Zealand when there was a moment that the New Zealand uh, government would, was saying that, you know, all we have to do for Māori is to smooth the pillow uh, because they felt that, uh, you know, Māori as a, as a people wouldn't exist. So as outrageous as that might sound, that is what propels that conversation with Anne and with myself, the sense that not only is the world this place where um, we can celebrate our humanity, but we must also understand that there is a lot of inhumanity. And that's why I liked your piece, Greg, because your piece ends on a most blistering line that I think that everybody should hear. Um, have we got time? Can I read about one minute of this poem? How about that if I read the beginning and the end? Well, actually, it's so interesting that Witty turned to you um. because I already thought I wanted to put you on the spot at the end. I'm aware we're at the end of our hour. Um. Um, and I think I read an interview with you once, Greg, where uh, someone asked about this particular poem and whether it, it, it felt quite heavy. But I think you reply that there's actually a lot of optimism in your writing. And uh, I think that's really wonderful. And I think all of this, what Witty was talking about as well, that we live with all these kind of known, uh, again, burdens. I use the word burdens, but we also live with so many unknowns, which I think does open up that space for looking at uh, the world of tomorrow and seeing where we're going and thinking about the world in bigger terms. So I think it would be really wonderful to 
close our conversation with Greg's poem. Okay, well, th thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Witty. Thank you for putting it in the book. Um, it's called Invocation. I, I guess it's about the world. I mean, the world is the is where we shelter. And I guess, la I suppose as a poet, poetry is where I shelter too, you know. But at the same time, it's not a very secure shelter and that actually with poetry and literature, as everyone agrees, um, all, all of life gets in. I mean, I, I always was interested in the idea of James K. Baxter's that it was the job of the poet to soak up the ill humours of the tribe. You know, so you do have to take the bad stuff in. But I guess the thing about really good writing, if, if we get there, if we get it across the line, is that it, it somehow the writing perhaps redeems the subject matter. So anyway, it's an invocation. It's probably in the tradition of Walt Whitman. It's a celebration of the world um, in all its colours. This world in sun or moonlight, in shadow, star encrusted, in clouded, thunderstruck, rain washed. This lenticular world through which other worlds are observed. This world and the variety of its movements. This world and its theories. This world from which you fall as from a great height into the arms of one or another. This world you hold, but not in your hands. This world which is cured, spoiled, seasoned, sanded, fermented, polished, tainted, cooled, ripened, ornamented, steamed, composed, aged, augmented, refreshed, dusted, percolated, warmed and weathered. This world as described by its typography, its topography, hydrology, meteorology and cloud physics, as it finds itself in a tangle of latitudes and longitudes and somewhere else entirely. This world marked return to sender. This world in which we are polar opposites but somehow find each other. This world, part soap, part cloud, part bird song, part aluminium smelter, part foxtrot. This world spinning on the axis of the present tense. This world, a part song, in part leaf, in part descending heron, in part flashing light bulb, in part plucked lyre, in part a towel wrapped around the head of someone loved. This world, this blazing hemisphere, this world and its poetry, that winged, fickle, sacred thing, Plato. This world, a quickening of another long forgotten world. This world you liken to a peacock feather, sea egg, nautilus, wine glass, teardrop. This world in its many harmonic parts, in its rigorous counterpoint, in its cacophony. This world that once swallowed the moon and was itself then swallowed by a fish. This world in which each day is its own renaissance. This world, a glass eye, a telescope trained upon itself, a mirror pond. This world, but only for now. This world in its own season, a profusion of sage, melon thistle, globe amaranth, prickly poppy, may apple, blood flower, water lily, sunflower. This world at the hour of our death, Greta, thank you so much, Greg. Thank you to everyone for coming. I think we want to say another special thank you to the library and their staff. They've set up a beautiful reception. So, And I think we all look forward to uh, talking with some of you while we mingle a little bit now afterwards. Uh, thank you to everyone for coming. It's really 
always very special to be able to share a book with an audience, for writers who are in a book like this to share in their own voices. Um, I think it makes it a really special uh, way of connecting the book to all of us and making it something real in this world. Uh, and finally, I'd like to thank all of the contributors in this book. Uh, a lot of them are not here, but let's say another special round of applause and thank you to the contributors here. Thanks. <laughs>